pleasure to be able to assemble again this evening and sing songs and and uh, hear a lesson from God's will. And Brother Tommy Chisholm will lead us in our first prayer uh, after two songs. The first song will be 603. The first and the third. <clears throat>
I don't know if you knew it or not, but October the 13th is International Skeptics Day. International Skeptics Day. A day set aside by atheists to try to get us to believe that God does not exist. And that is something they have promoted from time to time. And, and I got to thinking, do they really need a special day for that? Because it seems that almost every day there's something coming about that attacks on God, attacks on our faith, attacks on religion. But yet they want to have a special day like everybody else has their special day. So they maybe can put more emphasis on it to show that God is just a myth. Religion is just a fantasy. And none of these things are to, believe, to be believed unless they can be proven. If you can prove it, that would be great. But if you can't prove it and they put much of the Bible that away, well, then certainly it's not to be believed. Well, a special day. And yet at the same time, <clears throat> many people are falling for their trickery because atheism is the fastest growing religion. And yes, it is considered a religion in America, the fastest growing. People are falling for it, they're going for it, and, and because of that, again, it's had a, lot, a great effect upon our, our nation as a whole. It's these individuals, they're, they're loud from the standpoint of getting the people's attention. At one time, let's go back maybe 25, 30, 40 years ago, you heard nothing out of them. But all of a sudden, over the past several years, we might say they've gotten louder and louder in trying to get people to believe. And here's what they want us to believe, that faith is just a leap in the dark. But really, it isn't. Faith is not a leap in the dark, because according to Hebrews 11 and verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God has given us evidence. He has not given us something to believe in with no evidence, something we just got to say, okay, we'll take his word for it, he has given us plenty of evidence that what he has created has a, has a creator. He has told us that. So our faith is not a leap in the dark, but it is a faith that has evidence. And that's a very good thing. Now this skepticism, it goes back all the way to the Old Testament. There are individuals back in those days even that were skeptics. For example, in Exodus chapter 4, and verse 1, this is when Moses goes before God. He's about to go before Pharaoh. He's going to also go before Israel while they're in Egypt and tell them, God has appointed me to lead you out of this Egyptian slavery. Well, Moses is thinking, now why are they going to believe me? Why are they going to believe that God has sent me? And then in verse 1 there, then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So, so Moses got a pretty good, good, good question here. How are they going to know that I have been sent by you? And God says, I'm going to give you a couple of things for them to see. Should they be skeptic about it, you can show them and then they will know that you have come from me. I've been sent by me. So, first thing God does, he says to Moses, you see that staff you're holding? Okay. It turns into a snake. Scares Moses to death. I reckon so. It wouldn't me too. And Moses backs away from it because it's a snake. And then God says to Moses, pick it up by the tail. And then he did. He got the nerve to do it. He picked it up and it returned back to his staff that he had. Well, that was going to be the first thing that Moses could use. If some of those in Israel would say, how do we know? How do we know God sent you? Moses could use that staff and turn it into a snake. Well, God gave him another proof. He said, Moses, take your hand and put it inside your coat, put it against your chest. And he did. And he pulled it out and his hand was with leprosy. I mean, it was covered with leprosy. And I'm sure that scared Moses. But then God told him, put it back in. He put it back into his coat against his chest there. He then pulls it out, and the leprosy is gone. So they don't believe the first thing about the staff turned into a serpent and then back to a staff. You will have this as well to show them that you have been sent by me. So in the Old Testament, even among some of God's people then, 
There would be those that would be skeptics. And we come into the New Testament during the day of Peter. Peter had those that were skeptics. In 2 Peter 3 and 3 and 4, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So during Peter's time, you had skeptics. You had doubters, scoffers. Ah, we don't believe this thing called Jesus. We don't. If it's really so, then where is he? You keep telling us that he's going to return. He's going to come back. And when Peter wrote this, it had been about 30 years since Christ had died, was resurrected, and ascended into heaven. About 30 years had passed. And they, at this time, the apostles, they were preaching. He's coming back. He's coming back. Just like we preach today. One day, he's coming back. But the scoffers, the skeptics kept saying, where is he? It's been 30 years. Imagine about today. It's been 2,000 years. But yet, we have individuals that will look at this from a standpoint of Jesus returning one day, and they'll laugh at it. Again, things haven't changed a whole lot. But yet, even during the time of Peter, you had those individuals that were skeptics. They didn't believe that Christ probably didn't come in the first place. And if so, he was just a mere man, and he's never going to return again, like the people, uh, apostles were teaching. Well, what about this faith with evidence? Where is this evidence that we know that God is true? Well, every design must have a designer. We know that. Uh, you take a work of art, maybe something that Leonardo da Vinci painted, or sculpture, or whatever it may be, we can look at that and we can say, boy, that, that painting just didn't happen because the paint buckets got kicked over and it made this beautiful painting. There had to be somebody there to paint, to draw off or whatever they would do in order to have that painting the way it was. We understand that. There's a designer. You take an automobile. It just didn't appear one day at the, at the sales department for you to purchase there had to be somebody, an engineer, to design that. There had to be somebody to make those parts. You had to have somebody to put those parts together. It just didn't one day appear. Will you understand that? We have evidence of this. Hebrews 3 and verse 3. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone but he who builds all things is God. So the Hebrew writer is going to use a building a home illustration, a house illustration, to prove the point. Who builds the house? you got to have a designer. you got to have a, a carpenter. you got to have a builder to do this. But even though they build the house, it's a very beautiful house, the one that builds the house should be the one that gets all the credit. Because look what he has done. Again, God uses this, the Hebrew writer uses this to show that God is the creator of all things. He has built all things. And God uses this very logic that we use so much today. Because we know, Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Something as small as a house, if it can be built by a designer, Think about this universe, how complex it is. It is more complex than any house. And yet we understand you can't have a house without first a builder. Why can't we understand you can't have a universe without a builder as well? And that builder was that of God. It's almost like if we were to take a, a computer. Of all the parts that make up a computer, and we put all those parts in a box and we start shaking it. How long would it take for that parts to form into a computer? A day? You think shaking for a day is going to do it? Or maybe for a week? Or maybe for a month? Or let's say a hundred years. We might look at that and say, I don't think it would ever be done. And that's why I would take it. There's just not a way possible you put all those parts in a box and start shaking and shake them. I don't care how long you want to shake them. It's never going to form into a computer. 
It's not going to happen. But yet there are some individuals who think that's the way God created. Or that's just the way the universe came about. Not that God created. It just all fell into place and we have what we have. Brother Thomas Warren, that many, many may recognize his name. He was a great uh, preacher, teacher, a great debater years ago. He since has passed. He was having a debate once with an atheist concerning creation and such. And as an illustration, he brought to that debate a prosthetic hand with the arm uh, attached to it from the elbow to the hand. And he said to this man, the atheist debater, look at this hand here. Would you agree with me it had to be somebody to design that hand and somebody to form that hand after you got the plan and then somebody to put the, everything together to make it look like a hand? And he asked that debater, would you agree with that, that this hand had to be designed and built by someone? And the debater said, well, yes, of course. Then Brother Warren said, what about this hand? He held up his hand. He said, this hand here, it moves in all kinds of different directions. It can hold things, it can grasp things. It has all kind of maneuverability. It can tell when something is wet, when something is dry. It can tell when something is hot, when something is cold. It can tell when something is rough versus smooth. If it gets cut, it can heal itself. It has a circuitorial system. It has a skeletal system. All this put together. And he said to this atheist, do you believe that this hand here had a creator? And the atheist said, no. He could understand the prosthetic. But he couldn't understand the real hand, which was by far more complex than anything that man could ever create made out of, you know, rubber or steel or iron or something like that. He knew it. He knew what the answer was, that atheist, but he just wouldn't say it. He wouldn't say it. We all understand that. We all understand it because what God has done, he has given us evidence, as Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, the evidence of things not seen. He has given us plenty of evidence before us, and if we don't want to believe it, well, we're just foolish is what we are. Anybody who doesn't want to believe it is just foolish. And God has called this individual foolish. In Romans 1, 20 and 21, Paul says, For since the creation of the world, his, evidence, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. God says here, with all the evidence I have put before you, everything is put before you, you look at it and you say, no, it just happened. God is saying they're foolish is what they are. Their hearts have been darkened. They just don't want to admit that there's a greater being than themselves. Paul brought that out. Again, it's brought out in Acts 14 and verse 15 through 17. Here it says, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Plenty of witnesses that can attest to God being the creator. And the writer here says, as Luke speaks this, he says, just look at the nature. Just look at all the rain we have. Look at the different seasons. And the very food you are putting in your mouth, that is a product of God. He made it possible. And he's trying to get it across to these individuals who are listening to these men here, these apostles. It's God who's doing all these things, not some 
imagination, not some myth that you have brought about, but the true one and living God. And that's why we find Psalms 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Handiwork. What we look out and see in the universe, that's simple stuff to God. And we may have a, a hobbies and things that we can do, and we can do it with our eyes closed. It's so simple to us. Well, the firmament, the universe, all that God has created, his handiwork, very simple to him. So when it comes to stepping out in, on a blind faith, no way. God says, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to give you plenty of evidence here to show as to there is a creator. And something else God has done to show us about his, he being the creator of all things. What about morality? Morality is something that has come from God. And what is happening today is how individuals are taking that away from God and we're saying, I want to make up my own morals. You can't do that. You will have a destruction if that happens. So what, who, who chooses what's moral and what's not moral? Do we let countries do it? This country here decides what's moral for their country and this country decides what's moral or is there a standard? Well, if it's not countries, what about, let's say, in the United States, what about different states? Are we going to let different states decide what's moral for their people and that state versus what's moral for somebody else? Or maybe it comes down to counties in that state. Are we going to let the counties decide what is moral and immoral? Well, no, let's do it this way. Let's let communities decide in those counties. Let's let each community decide what they want to be moral and immoral. Or maybe what about families? Let's just let a family decide what they want to be moral or immoral. Or better yet, what about just the individual? You, the individual, you go ahead and you decide what you want to be moral, and that's where we'll go with it. Well, that's what's happened in our country. We're taking the, the morality of God, and we have laid it aside. We don't want anything to do with it, get rid of it. It doesn't fit what I want to do. And what many are wanting to do in this atheistic society, I want to decide what is right for me alone. I'm okay, you're okay. And that's where they want to go with it. So they don't want this. And if that were to happen, what you're going to have is moral bankruptcy. I mean, it will destroy a nation. It will bring a nation down. And uh, there's been examples of that in past history of nations who have been destroyed because of this very thing and yet we know over time people change they certainly do you have a new generation you could very well have new morals and that's what happens when people get away from the word of god that's the standard for morality yet people get away from it and all of a sudden before you know it uh, what is right but suddenly becomes wrong what is wrong suddenly becomes right, and everybody's wanting to do what is right in their own eyes. Well, here's what they say. If there is no God who gives us a standard of morality, then it's left up to each individual to determine morals. And that's where the atheist wants to go with it. Let's just, you determine what's right, I determine what's right, and we just won't bother one another. That's what they want. But if you go back to when morality began, Whenever God gave those Ten Commandments, six of them had to deal with morals. Honor your father and mother. That's the right thing to do. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. Of the ten, six of them here concern how we conduct our everyday activities. How great it would be if we lived in a world that honored these things to honor these commands of God. If you had children who obeyed their parents, that'd be great. If you had individuals who wouldn't even think about murder or wouldn't think about adultery or stealing or false witness or coveting, how great it would be, how great it would be just in our community if we kept these, if everybody did. But, but we don't. Again, the Hebrew writer had this to say about morality. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is Hebrew writer speaking when God gave the Ten Commandments, really the, all the law system that he gave to Israel. Again, that was the moral law he gave to them, what they were to live under, to live by, what we are today. The morality is that which, which he gave in the old was brought over into the new. Morals are the same. It was wrong during the day of Moses to murder. It's wrong today. It's wrong to steal then. It's wrong today. It's wrong to commit adultery then. It's wrong today. All these God has brought over with us. The morals of God has given us. And we, if we we'll live by them, better off we'll be. 1 John 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. It's not a burden to keep the laws of God. They're for our good. They're for our good. He wants us to keep these. And if we will do so better our life will be. But it means we've got to humble ourselves before God. Do the way he says, put his way first. And if we will do that, well then our life will be so much better. Even for an atheist. If an atheist will keep the morality of God, he's going to have a better life. Now he's not going to see heaven, but he have a, he'll have a good life while he's on this earth. But if he wants to break those laws, he's going to be pretty miserable at times. Pretty miserable. So Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God has given us evidence. If we will look at it, if we will not have a foolish heart, if we will accept what he said and live under this, we'd have a good life now. It won't be trouble free. We'll have a very good life but really, what are we banking, banking about? That's the next life to come, the eternal life. And that's what we want to be prepared for. So plenty of evidence that God has given to us, and his words are right. If you're not a child of God, not a Christian, he wants you to become that Christian. Be baptized for forgiveness of your sins. Begin walking with him and begin growing every day, knowing and looking for all the evidence he's put out there to show us that he is God and he's going to keep his promise that need tonight to become a Christian or just need prayers to come back home, do so as we stand and sing our invitation. <clears throat>